evening and welcome to tonight's webinar brought to you by MHPN titled Coordinating Mental Health Care for People Experiencing Suicide Bereavement. Now this is a, a very big topic and we have had lots of interest from, from a whole lot of people and we can see on the chat box that people are already talking to each other and, and letting us know where, where you're from all around Australia. My name is Lynn O'Grady and I'm a community psychologist. I'm based at the Australian Psychological Society usually but I, I have the pleasure every now and again of facilitating one of these Mental Health Professionals Network webinars. So very pleased to be here with you um, this evening and this topic is one that I'm particularly interested in having worked in, in schools and in the communities and also um, about to finish my Master of Suicidology at Griffith University this, um, this semester. So really interested in the topic and, and really looking forward to our discussions this evening. I'd like to begin with an acknowledgement of the traditional custodians of the land and, and recognise that we are coming from all sorts of places around Australia. Based here in, in Melbourne, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations are our traditional custodians. I'd like to acknowledge their elders past present and, and future and, and acknowledge their contribution to our communities but also acknowledge for a topic like this that suicide is, is one of the um, one of the issues that, that they're facing significantly. So wanting to um, acknowledge that and, and bear that in mind as we as we think about this topic, although our case study is not doesn't have a particular focus on that. <laughs> It's um, a topic also that um, we need to be really mindful in terms of looking after ourselves. And when we do webinars, we know that they're fabulous ways of communicating and, and to be able to participate from the comfort of your home or your office. But when we're tackling a topic like this, we're also mindful that you're sitting at home perhaps and you might be on your own and, and don't have your normal supports around you. So right up front, I want to acknowledge that it, this is a difficult topic and I can see from the chat already that people are starting to share some of their own very recent experiences around around suicide and, and we know that, that people who um, have an interest in this, this topic are, are often impacted as all of us can be at any, any particular point in time. So we have resources that are available to you that you hopefully have, um, have been able to see which do have some um, information, so some websites and some um, phone numbers of course. So please um, think about what, what it is that you're needing, where you're at right now and what's going to be most helpful helpful to you and we will touch on this um, again towards the end. And bear in mind that if, if you're feeling like you, you know, you're getting too much, you, you can shut down the chat box, you can, you can even leave us for tonight and get the video recording later and watch it at another time when, when it might be a better time for you. So just take a moment to, to really plan what, what you might need to do to, to look after yourself this evening, it's really important. I mentioned that we have a panel that um, we're going, is going to be joining us and going through some information and you can see there and you would have hopefully already have seen from their bios that we've got a very experienced group of people who are very interested and experienced in, in this field. So I'm going to um, go through one by one and um, just ask them a, a very quick question just to introduce themselves. So I'll begin with Graham. Graham Fleming, Dr. Graham Fleming, he works in rural Australia and has a long history in suicide prevention and responses in the community. So Graham, from a GP's point of view, how important is the GP's role in, in this work? Well, I think it's very important uh, no matter where you are. Uh, often GPs are the first port of call. But for rural GPs, it's often the only port of call and uh, GPs need to, uh, to develop the skills to be able to deal with uh, suicide and uh, uh, support the people who are grieving at, at, uh, as a result of that suicide. And uh, for more importantly, I think also to educate their communities about uh, mental health and, and the things uh, that we can use to prevent suicide. Okay, thank you. And we're going to be hearing from you and some of your further thoughts about that. So thank you very much for joining us this evening and already can see the, the interest in the long years of this work that you've been doing. So looking forward to hearing some more about that. Jane um, is our next um, panellist and Jane is a social worker and been working with people bereaved by suicide for a long time as well. Um, Jane, what is it about this work that, that sort of is important to you or why you've been doing it for a while? For me, I think it's, it's really important to provide the right sort of compassionate care for people bereaved by suicide, um, not just at the beginning but through at many points throughout the process in the months and years afterwards. And um, most of what I know I've learnt, um, I've been privileged to learn from people who are bereaved and who have taught me how to best support people 
So I look forward to sharing some of that, uh, those yeah. learnings tonight. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you. Jacinta Hallgood is our, our next panellist and again Jacinta, you've been, you're a psychologist and you've been working in research and practice with, with clients for a long time. You, you set up the Master of Suicidology course that, I, that I've been um, doing for the last three years. So yeah. again, what is it that you find rewarding about this, uh, suicidology as, a, as an area of work and, and research? Uh, yeah, look, the most rewarding part I would have to say is um, really the privilege, the learning journey um, that comes from, I'm quite fortunate I guess being able to integrate my lecturing role with both research and my practice. So that for me is the most rewarding element, being able to see how evidence, how important evidence is and research and understanding um, what we do. But also more and more um, I guess I'm really appreciating and, and learning how to put lived experience um, from the very people I work with in fact at center, you know, at the core and essential to everything that we do um, in all of those domains. So, Fantastic, thank you and really looking forward to um, what you're, you're bringing as well. So already you can see that we've, we've got a range of people with different, different um, professional backgrounds but also different places of work and different ways of working and I, and I think that's what I love about these webinars that we bring that together and, and the idea that we've all got something to share and by working together we can, um, we can really um, support clients and, and grow the knowledge and understanding that we need. So lastly, but certainly not least, I'd like to introduce Dr Siva Bala who's a psychiatrist. So Siva has published papers in the area of suicide and you have that particular interest in collaboration between health professionals when, when supporting clients or patients. So why is this collaboration between health professionals so important to you Siva? Well suicide is something that really intersects a uh, number of health systems, child, adult, uh, general practitioners, uh, counsellors, uh, work and so on. So really a, a good wraparound service and making sure that we don't miss anyone who are left in the aftermath of suicide is important. Okay, fantastic, thank you. And I guess also for in terms of self-care that we're not feeling like we're the only ones that, that can be um, doing that wraparound to a client or a patient that we're actually sharing the load and, and um, also helping ourselves in that way as well, looking after ourselves as best we can. So. A great message and we'll explore that some more as well. So thank you to the panel and we'll return to them in a minute. We'll just do a little bit of um, ground rules and technical information. I can see already people are, are getting some technical support and asking some questions and looking like a lot of that's being resolved which is great. Hopefully you um, are aware of how webinars work. We, we're kind of getting lots of webinars that are available to us these days and if you've joined the MHPN webinars before you'll be very familiar with this. So the chat box as people have been um, already exploring is uh, able to be seen by, by everybody. So um, just bear in mind that um, treat it like a face-to-face -face activity even though um, we can't see all the faces, we know we're there. Um, so yes, just think about that as if you're in, a, in any other kind of group setting and things that you're sharing and, and um, supporting each other and I, I can see that's happening already. Um, if you find that the chat box is, is a bit much and it, it can, especially with lots and lots of people that we have tonight, it, it can get a bit dizzy and it can be a bit distracting. Cause you're trying to listen to what the panellists are saying, you're, you're processing your own thoughts and, and feelings I guess as well. So you can, um, you, you can ignore that and you can, or you can come in and out of it. You don't have to, you don't have to um, worry about that. Technical support is there, so technical issues you can put in the, in the chat box and that will be responded to as you would have seen. Or there's also um, a fax tab that you can you can click on to, or the Redback Help Desk is there with that phone number, so you can um, write that down in case you're needing it. And if there's a significant issue affecting everything, you'll be alerted. We have announcements that we can alert you to that. So hopefully that doesn't happen. It's, um, something that does typically happen but just in case. At the end feedback is important and MHPN do take that very seriously and continue to grow and develop these webinars to make them as successful as, as they, they are. So at the end a pop-up will come with a feedback survey which we'd really like you to, to can take the, the moment to complete and give us that feedback is really, really very helpful to us. So if you can do that, that would be great. So hopefully that's kind of covered off on all of the technical and, and how the webinar will work. We, we work our way through um, the panellists, have five minutes each to share their best 
kind of information that they can share in that short time, even though they have lots more to say. And then we'll open it up to some questions and answers. And we've been given many, many questions because there were so many people registered. We had lots of questions. So we've been through that and we're really wanting to stick very much to our case study and our topic so that we can make it as deep and meaningful as possible and not jump between a whole lot of topics. So there will be some questions that, that we won't be answering because of that. And we'll also keep an eye on the chat and if there's anything else that's coming through there, we'll, we'll pick up on those as well. So that's, that's how the webinar works, but really trying to get through as much as we possibly can. These are the learning outcomes. So really looking at how do we create this safe and supportive environment for people seeking care for suicide bereavement. So thinking about what is it that, that we can do as practitioners and thinking about how we set that up. Implementing key principles, providing an integrated approach in identification, assessment, treatment, support of people experiencing suicide bereavement. And of course we've got one case example which is, which is one example and we know that as I've already mentioned if we're talking about Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, if we're talking about LGBTI people, talking about others with, with many complex needs and um, different kinds of experiences. There'll be layers of other things that are happening. So just, just being mindful of that. But the principles hopefully that we share tonight and thinking about what suicide um, might bring in terms of bereavement that might be different to other kinds of bereavement hopefully gives you a really good solid starting place. And then from there just thinking about the other aspects that might be relevant to particular clients that you're seeing. We're also wanting to identify challenges, tips and strategies in providing a collaborative response to assist people who are experiencing suicide bereavement. We've already touched on that and the importance of doing that. Just a reminder of the case study, hopefully you've had a, had a read through of that, but just a bit of a reminder of, of the case study that we're going to keep coming back to tonight. So in the case study, Daryl, 38 year old married father of two children who are aged six and four years old, took his own life one month later and we're kind of positioning it at this point in terms of where our starting point is. His wife Melissa is struggling, she's lying awake at night with lots of negative thoughts. She's returned to work but she's finding it difficult to face people and she's feeling ashamed which is the experience that she's had in terms of the suicide. Melissa feels alone and confused in this, in this space and we've got some examples of what that, that means in terms of relationships and how people around her that she had been close to are, are behaving. Then one of the children who's the six year old boy is lashing out and Madeline, the four year old girl, is crying a lot and missing, missing her dad. So Melissa goes to the GP and she's looking at, at needing, thinking she's needing some kind of psychological care. So that's where we're pos positioning ourselves. And I can see that we've got 920 people online so far. So it's a fabulous, um, fabulous number of people joining us. We're very really pleased that you are, but it does highlight to us the importance of this topic. And so we're really very conscious of trying to stick to the case study, give you some information and, and um, share as much as we can in, in the time slot. So let's move on to you now, Graham, and, and get your um, perspective from a general practitioner, um, the sorts of, sorts of things that you'd be thinking about with this case study. I work in a town of about 3,000 souls and of over a 10 year period, we had 13 suicides and uh, that was an awful lot of counselling and a terrible time. And I understand how Melissa felt uh, with uh, a sense of despair and helplessness and confusion as a result of her loss of her husband. And grief from suicide is, is, a, is a devastating event and uh, it is probably uh, not much different according to Barrett and others uh, about uh, the grieving process but it's certainly tainted with uh, guilt and shame and stigma. Um, but the point is that recovery does sort of occur but it's a bit like a deep wound, painful wound that gradually heals over a period of time. And when Melissa pre presents, she might be looking uh, just to see if there is someone that might help her. And the first thing I really want to do is to establish rapport. I really want to know where she is in her grieving process and, and uh, I really want to provide some hope for her that there is a future for her and she will eventually recover somewhat even with a scar at the end of the time. The second thing that I really want to try and do is to deal with the uh, thinking that occurs in people who, who are about to suicide and to, to do something about the guilt and shame. And suicide occurs when there are three things operating. The first one is when there's a sense of hopelessness and despair. 
And the second thing that's required is a delusion that suicide is the only or the best option. And the third one is a determination to die. And here's my first take home message. That determination to die often isn't present in severely disturbed people because their brains are, are so shut down that they can't motivate themselves to get themselves out of the, the hole they're in. And it's only when you, they start to recover that they get motivated before the depression lives, lifts. So it doesn't really matter whether you're using psychotherapy or uh, CBT or one of its variations or um, antidepressants or just a holiday. Um, this is a warning time for three weeks. People need to be watched like a hawk. You might wonder why people jump, jump off lines when they're on holidays. The second thing that I really want to do is to allay guilt. And I would point out to her that sometimes there are warning signs. In the case of Daryl, there were warning signs. He was going downhill and uh, he had taken to alcohol. He became more despondent. And I'd point out that it's really very, very difficult to persuade men to go and seek help because it's a sign of weakness and they're supposed to be the defenders of the family. Um, it's becoming easier with education and with uh, cardiac disease for men to go to get their cardiac symptoms sorted out and we need education to convince men that that's the same same uh, sort. Um, the other thing about Daryl is he's been drinking and you probably find that 50 to 80 percent depending on the society of people who commit suicide have alcohol on board. It's salient to remember. Sometimes um, there aren't uh, warning signs on the surface but when you look back in the past you can actually see there were pointers to that particular suicide. And sometimes there seems to be no explicable reason, no matter how hard you look at the, the, the victim, you can't find a cause. Um, and uh, it's just that the, the severe mental pain they have or the, the delusion that the world would be better off without them and they, they believe it's an act of bravery to take their own side, their, their own life. And so the second take-home message I would like to give to everybody is that intrusive suicide thoughts are a medical or a health emergency. It's no different from a 60-year-old man who in actual fact has got central chest pain and is getting that on an intermittent basis. That needs assessment and management immediately, not sometime in the future. The third thing I'd point out to her, there is no right or wrong way to grieve and I would examine where she is in the grieving process and point out that what's happening to her is absolutely normal and she's not going mad. I would really be keen for her to find a support person in the network uh, or a network which is essential for her recovery. Uh, I would uh, suggest very strongly she support, uh, get some support from an empathetic GP. Uh, which is extremely helpful and I would uh, offer her my services on a, on a uh, weekly or even more often basis for the first three or four weeks uh, and bulk bill her so she's not going to have any more financial um, problems. The third thing I would do is to suggest that her, to normalise her routines and she discusses she feels a bit robotic and that's not necessarily a bad thing because at least it gets the routines going, takes the mind off things and, and she starts to make some headway to the future. I'll try and persuade her to get uh, greater access uh, for uh, friends and families, grandparents, her siblings uh, for help for the children and maybe to provide a father figure which is now missing in the family. And finally I would uh, say look, um, we need to think about some future projects uh, and all the GPs uh, who are listening will be saying how do you do this in 20 minutes or 15 minutes and you can't. It's no different from when someone collapses in your surgery with a uh, heart attack. You have to stop what you're doing until it's sorted out and if that takes an hour so be it. Um, usually the staff can sort that out. And the future assist sort of assistance I would suggest you requires is to seek the advice of a financial counsellor or a bank manager. She needs to talk to the principal at the school about the, the welfare of the children and for them to be watched carefully and for the school counsellor perhaps to be involved. She should perhaps find an independent counsellor or a psychologist for herself 
but in rural areas that is exceedingly difficult. Uh, it may take uh, 6 to 14 weeks for an emergency to be seen. Uh, and I would expect her to unload her feelings and frustrations with a psychologist as also with a GP. Uh, to assist with the social considerations uh, about uh, how she's managing with her friends and, and what's going on in her life. Some assistance with Centrelink and for that reason a, a social worker would be useful but again they're often not present in, in rural communities. And the final thing that I would suggest is a conference with family and friends because this way we can get everything out in the open. People tend to have rumours or think about what might have happened and uh, what hasn't happened and what, who caused it and, and all that uh, sort of emotional stuff. And sometimes if everybody has understanding why people suicide, not necessarily why Daryl suicided, but why people in general suicide and what we can do about it, that is extremely useful. In my town, we use public meetings uh, for a postvention and they are very, very helpful and successful. Uh, so much so that uh, we had one 19-year-old uh, boy committed suicide. He played a, a, a wonderful game of football, was best on ground for the day, went out to a 21st party that night, had some alcohol and was found hanging in the shed uh, in the next morning. The, the, all the young people in the town didn't go to work, didn't go to school, they just stand sort of around grieving and uh, the, the citizens came to me and said, what do we do? And I said, let's have a public meeting. We'll hold it in the football club rooms. One young man was heard, one of the, the uh, rebellious uh, feral young men uh, from the football club was heard to say as he walked out, we must mate, we must start uh, looking after each other. They were music to my ears. So I think that uh, public meetings after suicide uh, are very, very useful um, uh, scenarios. And the final thing I would like to say is um, care for the carer. Often there's a policeman or an um, ambulance officer who, who's come across the scene. Um, it may be a neighbour and we need to actually uh, look after those as well, see them in a week, see them in a month, see them in three months. And um, I, I was tapped on the shoulder by one of my um, uh, junior colleagues who said, uh, the reception staff think you're not your normal self and you need some help, you might need some help uh, and I can arrange that for you. And once I got over impudence, I started to think about it and she was right, I did. And so look after yourself as well and that's my final take home message. Thank you, Graeme. I had so much that you were sharing there and I, I think some of it is around the complexity of um, what somebody faces when life has changed in such a significant way. So thinking about the, the so, sorts of things for Melissa now that, that there's the grief and the, the emotions but there's all of these practical things as well and then the community and we know that people, protective factors are people coming together when at a time like this people might, might come apart when you actually want them to be there. So the idea of a, a public meeting can, can be a way of bringing that support together which you, you explained very well. Hunter Institute has um, some resources that do talk about those those meetings so it would be great for um, people to have a look at that as well because I'm, I'm sure if you haven't done that before or you're wanting to do it, it would be really um, good to be thinking about how do we do it and how do we plan for that and who can help us with that. So those resources are really helpful. So thank you very much, Graham. Lots of information. I'm sure that's getting people keep starting already to be thinking about what does this mean for me? What does it mean for my community? Do we have school counsellors at the school? Do we have financial counsellors that people can access? And, and do I know that? Do I have this at my fingertips if somebody comes to see me? So um, every community will be different, but what is it that you can access is a really important message there. So thank you very much, Graham. Now we're going to move on to Jane and Jane is going to give us a social worker perspective. So over to you now Jane, thanks. Hello everybody, thank you. So the first thing I, I wanted to highlight is that suicide bereavement takes um, in the months after the death um, takes place in the context of the medico-legal investigation of the death. So family members have contact with and grapple with systems like police, Coronial systems, hospitals, morgues, forensic systems, funeral director, um, and at the same time there's also the bureaucracy of, of the death, things like having to produce proof of death to 
the bank to Centrelink to other agencies. And um, we, the investigative aspect of the death um, can really delay some of those bureaucratic processes. It can take many months sometimes to get a final death certificate, sometimes even longer, sometimes a year or two. And family members often express that the investigation and the bureaucratic processes as add another layer of trauma and stress um, on top of the death itself. Um, so I think we need to be mindful of the impact of that and provide that sort of the psychosocial support and help through that. Um, and it may also be that Melissa needs to understand the mechanism of the death itself and um, the question about whether um, Daryl suffered in those last moments uh, may be really burning and important for her at different points in the process. And being able to talk to her GP or um, a medical social worker um, or um, uh, a nurse or other healthcare professional about what happened and trying to understand that may be really important. Um, we know um, that being able to spend time with a person's body after um, after a loved one's death can be really important, and um, especially when they're provided choice, information, and support around that. But it can also be really confronting, and many family members experience finding the person's body, and um, it, it's important to help for us to help reassure Melissa that her vivid memories of that, her nightmares and and intrusive thoughts around that, are very normal in the context of her mind processing what she saw and how she feels about that, and to provide that support and help through that, and perhaps down the track to also, if those memories and thoughts don't uh, dissipate, which they most often do, to provide some really focused support around processing that, with the aim of sort of integrating that story of the death event, as Robert Niemeyer talks about, integrating the story of the death event into a, a cohesive <coughs> narrative. Um, we also want to um, help um, Melissa make sense of what's happened. Um, and that might be accessing reports, but it might also be just talking over and over what happened and trying to make sense of that for her. Um, the, the duality of the, of the investigatory process often means it's very intrusive and lots of questions are asked, but at the end, family members can often be left feeling very let down that the questions they had weren't answered by that process. So um, processing that story and having, ha having some help to do that is really important. Um, I guess one of the main um, areas uh, as well is um, that people grieve in the context of their family and that we need to be family sensitive in our practice in terms of providing support not just to the individual but to their family and the community in which they live. Um, and um, for Melissa that means perhaps providing support to help her um, explain and, and support, explain to her children um, what's happened and, and provide support to her uh, in terms of that explanation. We know that children tend to grieve in bits and pieces, that they they perhaps need frequent checking in about their questions. But they may not focus on those questions for very long. It may just be a brief um, period of time. Um, but to have that opportunity to listen to the children and to provide them age-appropriate information, which may, and, and that they may have questions and reactions and feelings that vary down the track. Um, and that children often don't have particularly strong emotions, and sometimes they do, and that both of those things are normal in that, um, in that process. Um, and for me, I think providing support is about um, a model of um, perhaps um, being an expert companion through the process. Jack Jordan talks about expert companioning from the moment of the death right through the months and, and perhaps years that follow. Not everybody has that ability, but um, the GP or other services may be able to offer that service where people can dip in and out of the support that they need um, so that um, they can receive the, the sorts of different help at different points in the process. Thank you. Thanks, Jane. And uh, I think, again, that giving us some examples of what might be a bit different from a, a death that um, is a suicide that involve perhaps lengthy investigations and um, inquiries and things that, that might not happen with, with other kinds of deaths. So I, I think giving us some really 
um, good insight with one of those questions that was coming through was around how is suicide death different and what would bereavement be like. So there might be some legal aspects and um, things like that that make it different. I liked the expert companion. I, I thought that, that was a, an interesting way and, and over time, which of course for some people might might be something they can build into their role, but for others it, it might be a challenge. So then again, who do we know that might be able to play that role, or, or how can we how can we build that system of support around around a client? So great ideas there as well. So thank you, and we'll pick up on some more more of those in the in the question and answer time as well. So thank you very much. Over to you now, Jacinta. So moving from GP to social worker to psychologist. So interested to hear um, you're, you're going to pick up on some of the, the research and some of the evidence around it as well. So we'll, we'll be interested to hear from you as well. So thanks. Yeah, thank you, Lynn. Um, so look, I was just going to touch very briefly, firstly, on a couple of um, background issues. Uh, firstly, about the terminology, then about who is affected in a conceptual way, um, and then what does postvention look like. So firstly, the coin, uh, the, the term postvention was first coined by Schneidman in 1969, and it was to refer to both the therapeutic, the educational, and organisational activities that occur in the wake of a suicide. Um, and when we talk about bereavement in regards to bereavement by loss by suicide, um, it's important to understand that the bereavement consists of both grief or grieving and, and mourning. So grief is the reactions in the case of suicide, which a whole range of reactions which we can talk about um, subsequent to this. Uh, and, and mourning is the vehicle or the mechanism um, through which we grieve. Uh, and so um, I've got a few terms there, suicide survivor and bereaved by suicide or suicide bereaved. And a suicide survivor is something that is used, a term used mostly in the US um, to refer to those who've lost someone by suicide, whereas bereaved by suicide is a term which, or suicide bereaved, that mostly in the literature the Commonwealth countries refer to um, in regards to someone who's lost someone by suicide. Um, and this isn't necessarily too important, but it can be important in terms of research so that we can more accurately classify and, and communicate. Um, and of course, there's people who don't like to or, or have referred to themselves as not wanting to be referred to in these ways at all as well. Um, and then I guess um, one way in reflection of, of the complexity um, of the phenomena of bereavement and, and the very individual trajectories that um, people experience when they're bereaved by suicide, um, we have more recently proposed by Julie Sorrell um, from America and her colleagues, um, a suicide survivorship continuum. And if you look, want to look up this article, it provides a bit of a multi-layered um, understanding, just again to help inform policy and, and practice a little bit better. Um, and, and on this continuum, at the very most, if you imagine circles with the smallest circle in the middle and the largest on the outside, four circles, the largest would refer to in, in this continuum those exposed um, to suicide, which we, which is roughly about 40% of those um, in a survey that might talk about being impacted in some way are those who have been exposed to suicide, and that refers to people who've even either known someone by by who's died by suicide, or who have um, witnessed um, a suicide themselves. Um, and it, it doesn't necessarily mean that those who have witnessed a suicide, such as, for example, train drivers, etc. Um, just because they haven't known the person well, won't experience also the next circle in on this continuum would be those who are affected by suicide. Um, and those who are affected according to this continuum are those who have significantly um, known the person, had a significant relationship or an intimate relationship, um, but also may don't necessarily have to include a partner or family member, can refer to um, friends or peers as well. Um, and then slightly in from this layer are those suicide bereaved in the short term. Um, and these, of course, whilst the groups get smaller, um, these, of course, may refer to those um, family members as well, intimate others, also work colleagues, etc. cetera. Um, and regards to uh, the short-term effects, obviously those where acute um, responses or services might be of help. Um, and then at the very centre of the continuum uh, is suicide bereaved long-term, and there's about um, 30% of people who, over a long period of time, start to experience more complicated um, experiences that cause quite de um, debilitating impacts on them. And um, usually, I guess, most of the literature are referred to as those suffering from complicated grief, um, and they, they experience much more and go on to develop much more severe um, symptoms 
uh, and and problems. Um, so I'm so sorry. Here we go. I'll just move on to the next slide. Um, um, in response to those experiences, um, postvention is something, as I referred to before, that has a multi-layered approach. And this is a visual pictorial, I guess, or diagram of um, looking at not so much a ripple effect, if you like, but a tsunami effect. Um, and I just put this together to reflect, try to incorporate um, some of Julie Thrill and colleagues' continuum of understanding, but also to demonstrate um, how there's a huge, huge impact from one suicide, as I'm sure everyone's very well aware. Um, and what we know is what might be helpful in terms of response. Um, you can see I've put their clinical individual type responses, which might benefit those more seriously or intimately affected. But those who are exposed at a much wider level at the community level or, or subgroups such as school settings, work settings, etc., may benefit from both. Um, individual and public community responses. That's just a quick visual um, of how we respond. So applied to the loss of Daryl, um, and I must say that this case study is um, really, I thought, quite a really good one because it depicts what, um, in my practice at least, what might um, come to me in terms of um, someone's presenting problems. So Melissa's, this experience, it, it would be quite common. And um, if we use the, the suicide survivorship continuum to target our responses, um, I would imagine that in this case study, Melissa, the children, say the parents of Daryl and the friend Karen, in the first instance, would be seen as those affected, um, whilst workplace colleagues and school peers, etc., still may be affected, but but would also be considered, um, and those within the rugby teams or um, other extracurricular activities or other social clubs of Daryl. Um, that may not necessarily have known him well but have heard of the suicide would be in the exposed group. Um, and, and the continuum goes into a lot more depth in that article and so I'd encourage you to have a look at that. But it is important then to look at the impacts that are experienced at all these different levels. And clearly um, these impacts can be quite fluctuating. There's no linear journey in terms of brief responses. But the reactions, particularly for Melissa, at least that I've read in this case study, um, are, are very much rejection, shame, guilt, feeling a burden, particularly over time, experiencing some anger and, and really struggling with um, the, the, the management of those feelings and also trying to, um, the numbness, et cetera, experienced in the acute phases um, also means that um, the processing of those is limited um, in the immediate moment as well because she's trying to deal with the, the children's responses and very conscious of those. Um, and that leads to um, the questions that you also saw there that that Melissa has asked about, um, you know, um, what sort of, uh, what, what sort of, um, why didn't he seek, seek help, etc. And so the biggest question that we see in the literature is why. Um, even if people are able to put the pieces together, that answer um, to why um, is very difficult to to um, find information for, and uh, it's very difficult. And I think that needs to be acknowledged very much so that it's a very common question. Um, and of course, there'll be physiological reactions and impacts, withdrawal, and a whole range of things I'm sure we'll discuss later. Um, developmental differences regards to the children um, need to be considered. They require additional differences. They require the truth. Um, factual basis, especially at the ages of six and four, very important, that needs to be considered. And the, as I said, regards to the previous slide, the context, there's multi-layers of response that's required. And how we do this if we're looking at postvention responses is we need to be proactive and not reactive. So in other words, there should be in each community um, um, a postvention plan um, that, that is known by many, many stakeholders, including these key groups of schools, different levels of the community, um, where um, when such an event occurs, there's able to be easy access and knowledge because the biggest finding in a lot of ASRAP's research is that um, people who bereaved tell us that they didn't know where to turn, um, they didn't know what, what might be the right help, was their response normal, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so, you know, I've, I've put a list of resources there that I, I know we'll talk a little bit more about. Um, but in the essence of time, um, I think I just wanted to quickly select two slides, which I don't have time I know to go through, but I really wanted to put them here, and it was to really show that um, of all the empirical evidence that we do have in the literature, um, we know that um, general bereavement doesn't necessarily have any effective um, results from from therapeutic interventions. However, those such as those who 
those such as people who have experienced a loss by suicide, the high risk mourners, so to speak, are those who do demonstrate the greatest differences and positive results from, from having um, uh, interventions such as these on the screen, which you could, I'll put a few references there for you to have a look at, um, support groups and group sharing, others who've been through the same thing, um, general group sharing, and in some studies, writing and nar narratives and storytelling um, is a really important brief. And of course, there's a lot more. I'll, I'll have to close now, but thank you for listening. Thanks, Jacinta. So much to say. <laughs> such little time so it's always really hard to, to share a lot of information and, and I think um, what people often like in webinars is, is what do I do in my practice, what do I take away, what can I, what can I implement tomorrow. So I think these, this kind of information can be really helpful because you can look at that as a practitioner and, and say well, what are the sorts of things that I, I can do and then if there are some things there that might be really useful for, for um, the client, who else can help and who might be able to provide that, that additional support or, or quite different support. And, and I I think the research is really important and, and we do want to be looking at what the evidence is. We've got a lot of activity happening around the country in terms of suicide prevention and, and some research and funding that's, that's going in into a whole lot of new initiatives and, and really looking at how the research and practice can come together. So I, I think it's an exciting time um, from that point of view but still a lot that we don't know and still a lot that we're learning and a lot of different situations and, and people um, responding in lots of different ways. There was one quick question around terminology that um, came through and Margaret um, has asked about those people who have attempted suicide and survived, what language um, would, would be used for, for them and Jane has commented that lived experience would include people who are bereaved by the death of somebody as well as people who may have attempted suicide so that lived experience can cover both of those. Um, but any other language, Jacinta, in terms of people who have attempted suicide and survived? Um, yeah, yeah. look, um, I've spoken to many people, um, obviously not just at post-discharge from a medically treated suicide attempt, um, but those who perhaps have had in aborted attempts, meaning they themselves have pulled out of it or it has been an interrupted attempt where someone who's loved them or been close to them has fortunately been able to step in. Um, and the, the term more recently, suicide attempt survivor, is what um, generally is referred to, at least um, in the literature. So yeah, it's it's. Um, but I mean, again, it's very individual, and I have I, I haven't come across anyone that I've worked with, at least in hearing their stories, that they have, have felt uncomfortable. But I'm I'm sure we have to be very sensitive to the fact that there's. There's, there's some people who, who don't like to have a label, not that it necessarily is a label, but I think it represents someone who's gone through such a significant um, and probably still in a fluctuating sense over time experiences those um, impacts. Yeah, sure. Okay, so maybe checking out, exploring the language that, that people are comfortable with, but, but being aware about language because we do, and again, the Hunter Institute do a lot of work around media and um, the sorts of language that media use and often on Twitter you'll see them picking up on, um, they picked up on the ABC today I saw this morning actually, just on the language that's used and the information that's shared. So there's a lot of awareness around, around language and, and the meanings that people attribute to language. So checking in with clients around what, they, what makes sense to them I guess as part of that meaning making that Jane was talking about. I can see some questions which I'm going to have a look at in a moment but I'm going to move on to, to Siva now. So thank you very much Jacinta. And we'll come back again and talk some more about some of those those things. So, Sivi, you're going to pick up on on this, and and I'm hoping that some of the questions that people are asking you might answer anyway. So let's let's hear from your perspective as a psychiatrist. Well, when I'm asked to see people as a psychiatrist, it's really because the uh, bereavement, uh, the mourning, has become pathological. So the question is, is this normal bereavement? Should there be some treatment provided, particularly medication point of view? If I take a step back from this to explain that uh, the research in this area is limited. Grief, bereavement, mourning, they are such vague and uh, profound constructs. They vary across cultures, they, they vary across families and individuals, um, uh, metro, rural areas, so there is no one-size-fits-all approach. Uh, and it's not a matter of medication or some form of therapy, but it's really a journey. Uh, that one has to enter in with the patient. Ultimately, suicide uh, invites questions about the 
meaning of life or the meaninglessness of life? What is it that um, pushes us forward with survive? And, and uh, that in itself is the subject of another another whole webinar, I'm sure. It's only a hundred years ago that Freud wrote his famous essay, Mourning and Melancholia. He said that mourning was about a conscious ghost of a loved one, whereas melancholia, which perhaps we equate to depression, is much more pathological and profound. So just put simply, when grief, uh, normal grief, is really about the other, losing a loved one, how that impacts on, a, on the individual, uh, their sense of self and their life, and uh, depression is much more about the self, the individual, their self being diminished, and their interpersonal functioning and relationship diminished in a much more profound way. So I'll put them slides there, and I won't read through them because I think we're running behind on time and panel members completed. But taking Melissa, for instance, one month after the death of uh, uh, her husband, I wouldn't be rushing in to make any diagnoses. The diagnostic criteria for uh, in the DSM-5, the latest uh, uh, iteration of the manual that psychiatrists use, which is really expert consensus, it's not the be-all and end-all, but the latest uh, iteration uh, has taken bereavement out. So it really leaves the judgment up to the individual clinician to decide whether if this person after a sufficient period of time, and that could be two months or 12 months, there's no time specified. If they meet all the criteria for major depression, then that could be diagnosed and treated. So in Melissa, I'll be looking for um, a history of depression or emotional vulnerability that would heighten my uh, threshold for diagnosing that and potentially treating it. Is there previous depression diagnosis that has required treatment with antidepressant medication particularly? Um, is there substance use? Is there suicidal ideation? Those sorts of things. Uh, but one month, I would be cautious. I wouldn't be rushing in with any diagnosis. If a year from death, uh, we're still at a stage where Melissa is profoundly sad, she's not sleeping, she's not functioning well, she feels guilty, then I might possibly contemplate that. And that goes to what Jacinta mentioned. There are a percentage of people, perhaps 15 to 30 percent, who have a much more persistent and complex Sorry, are you are you still there? Yes. Yep. Yeah. Sorry. So yes. I thought I'd now uh, just stop there and, and leave okay. it to, to the audience and, and you if you have any questions. Um. Okay, you're helping me make up time, Siva. <laughs> Very helpful. <laughs> is there anything in particular that you think is really important? Because you do have the slides there, and people are asking if the slides are available. Now you should be able to access in the, in the resource with the resources. So anything in particular. Um, my slides are really taken straight out of the DSM-5. There's mm -hmm. an ongoing debate really in, in the field of psychiatry about what is pathological grief, what is normal grief, what is depression. Um, and really the default position is to not medicalize anything for a significant period of time. So six to 12 months uh, should be allowed for the grief to resolve in various ways and normal mm -hmm. support mechanisms to kick in. Sometimes extra might be needed, whether that's family meetings or community meetings. But really, it should be up to the individual. And I'd be working with Melissa here about what are her needs, what are her wishes, respecting and supporting her decision making, uh, getting advocates, allies, um, and so on. And uh, it really depends on Melissa's background and family context. Yep, fantastic. Really important message I guess to really work and, and where is Melissa at and, I, and in the case study we're saying it was a month in so you're saying that's very early you wouldn't want to be jumping down a path of, of looking at anything that was that was a, a real concern in terms of complicated grief or um, anything serious at that point but you'd be wanting to make sure she's supported and, and um, working towards um, understanding what's happening rather than even thinking about any of this at, at that point yes. in time. Yeah, yeah. The temptation in all our parts to do something. We're all trained mm. uh, yep. as clinicians to act, to, to do something. But yeah. sometimes just standing back and just joining the person on that journey is very helpful. And yeah. also being very practical, as the others have mentioned. Sometimes mm. it could be something that's very practical, just supporting her with accessing finances. If the husband died without a will and the bank accounts are in his name, uh, yeah. she could easily be locked out 
and yeah. might have to go through the Supreme Court to get uh, access to finance. Or something as simple as that mm. uh, that can make a profound difference. So there's a lot of practical help that needs to be provided and supporting yeah. her through that journey rather than leaping in too quickly with treatment, whatever sort that is, uh, and just allowing the process to unfold in a natural way, I think. Mm. Yeah. I guess we're getting better over time at understanding the resilience of people and I think every every panellist talked about that in, in one way or another, that with support and, and um, by, by helping people with some of those practical things and with time, people can be incredibly resilient even there though... There is something um, called um, post-traumatic growth in the psychology mm. field, it's not yeah. spoken about in the psychiatry field, but yeah. that profound change uh, in a positive way, in the internal transformation can come about as a result of traumatic yeah. experience. So it's uh, it's uh, something that uh, we wouldn't say that to Melissa right now. That would be very no. insensitive. Yeah. But uh, helping her stay in that journey and later down the track reflect that some change, um, a greater sense of meaning and purpose, perhaps connectedness to family, a realization of what are true priorities in life, those sorts of things might come about. Yeah. As a result of this. Yeah. Great. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. And yep, the slides are all available so that people can, can look at those as well. Now we'll move on to the question and answer. And I've had a look at the questions and I think a lot of them we are going to, some of them might have been covered already by Siva, which is great. Um, and some of them we're going to cover in the question and answers that we've already planned for. So we'll move on with that and then we'll see how we go, go with time. So one of the um, first questions and one of the questions that's come up already in the um, in the whole list that we had from people when they registered but also I can see the, the questions that people are asking in the chat tonight is around um, what to tell children. So I've got a, a question for Jane and I think someone was asking Jacinta about what you mentioned about children as well. So perhaps Jane and Jacinta could share this one. So the question is how are children and young people best supported when they lose a parent to suicide? So you've already touched on this a little bit Jane, um, yes. but Jacinta I think you said something about telling children the truth and somebody's picked up on that. So perhaps between the two of you a little yeah. bit more detail about what you what you might do if you were Melissa or you were advising Melissa or helping her work through options, yeah. what would you be saying? So if I, I might say a couple of things and then Jacinta might want to hop in. Um, so I think the first thing um, is for helping Melissa understand the importance of making a space for her children to ask questions and to talk about how they feel or express how they feel. Um, and that that might need to happen quite frequently. Um, not a great big one, great big conversation, but a number of different conversations over over the time. Um, and that, that it's important not to burden children with the expectation of certain emotions. And family, an extended family, can often do that. Sort of try and say, oh, you you must be really sad, or you must. Be, um, but children often have very conflicting emotions around suicide, and so it's important just to be able to uh, not burden them with expectation around that. I think the framework of emotion coaching can be really helpful for really um, in, in bereavement where um, you provide an opportunity for the child to express what they're um, feeling and then um, and tune in to what they're feeling and recognize the emotion as a part of a, an opportunity or a, a for learning or intimacy um, and listen empathetically and then importantly help the, help the child have a label for what they're feeling. Um, so you're feeling angry, or you're feeling sad, or you're feeling frustrated, and it's okay to feel those things. And then help set limits around um, behaviour while also providing some problem solving about how to manage those difficult feelings. I think routines and boundaries are really important for children as they're navigating this, and they create a sense of safety and security for children, and helping Melissa understand how to reinitiate routines and boundaries. And so it's important for her as well to involve others and ask for help as she, you know, we know that it takes a village to really help raise children and Melissa is now suddenly a single parent. So um, being able to help her get the support that she needs to support the children. Um, and I think provide, often we want to come up with the right phrase, tell a child of five or a child of eight. I, I, I tend not to try and do that because even though it sounds really good when you can say a phrase like, um, you know, daddy's body stopped working or daddy made his body stop working. 
that might work for some children but not for others. So I think it's really important to try and be really focused on first saying, what, what do you think happens, Dad? What, um, get elicit their understanding. And then go from there to start building a picture of what they and their fears that they might have or what, about what happened and finding words that reflect their understanding and meaning at different ages and different points. Linda? Thanks, Jane. Yeah. Yeah, thanks, Jane. Yeah, look, I mean, I don't have too much more to add. I think definitely the factual information is important and I would definitely would start, um, and this is keeping lived experience as central even for children, um, where they can talk, of course, but um, is, is asking them what they, they do know about it and what are their thoughts around it first. And, and particularly for mothers and, and fathers, um, and especially a lot of my more experiences come from when their siblings have died. Um, so there's, there's a lot of um, holding in emotions and we know from more recent research that all those communication pathways where we hold information or um, understandably because you're trying to manage your own feelings as well, um, but that can actually cause more problems. And for little kids, um, I would first ask them, do they understand what death is in the first instance? Like when, yes, when your body stops working all that, but I get their opinion and, and perceptions first and then go into explaining the little ones who may not understand. And we've had feedback from kids that have actually said, you know, don't, that they didn't know what the word suicide was. So explaining them that, that that's when, you know, daddy took his own life. So he killed himself or um, he didn't want to live anymore. Um, but with that explanation, so you're giving factual inf information, it's very important that um, you provide information around daddy couldn't cope anymore or your brother couldn't cope. He felt like there was no way out. And um, you know, sometimes when your heart hurts so much and in your heart, your whole body starts to hurt and there's no way of stopping that pain at all. They saw that as, that, that he saw that as the way out and the only way to stop that pain. And then equally um, and necessarily spending um, a, a lot of time then on saying, if that happens for you, um, this is you know going into what would you do to seek help, um, particularly if they're a little bit older, um, and and making sure that people are well, um, that the kid, the child, or the adolescent, whoever is very well aware of um, that it's okay to seek help and talk about your problems. This is what's so important, um, and and everything about you is so special and it's really, really, really sad. We can never bring him back and la 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 and going on to how to cope and problem solving, et cetera, um, in ways that will assist that person to manage their feelings if they ever get to that point. So, um, and another big thing with children, and we know they tell kids who ha weren't told when they were younger have told me in my practice that it, ha it has really haunted them or been very difficult for them not having been told. Um, and when they finally found out the answer, um, that they felt ripped off in a sense. Um, and so I think it is important that we give factual information. Kids will fill in the gaps in their own ways. They will hear, overhear stories from family members or cousins or friends or whatever, and they will make sense of it in their way, um, which can often be fill, filled with myths or inaccurate information. And so we, we want to make sure that they have the right information, that we do everything we can to, to, to assist them to cope. Um, if they were in that same situation. Okay, thank you. It's, it's obviously a, a big question and I guess you're always working with Melissa and what she's comfortable and her making meaning of it as well in terms of how, how she approaches it but, but certainly thinking about it from the point of view about what we can expect children to understand and, and the impact down the track of, of sharing particular information. And I can see in the, in the chat that um, somebody's talked about the idea about dad going to heaven and then waiting for dad to come back from heaven. So children being quite literal as well. So yeah, very big um, topic I think for, for people. So hopefully that's helped. In the resources we do have some um, um, some websites about talking to children about suicide, so hopefully that will be useful as well. Um, looking at our big long list of questions and trying to keep track of what's going, what, what people are asking in the in the chat as well. 
one of the questions that's come up quite a bit is around um, the lack of services and perhaps in, particularly in rural areas and I know we've all kind of touched on it a little bit but perhaps Graham, a question for you is around um, how do you kind of manage within a rural and you did touch on it but in a rural community or or it might even be in a metropolitan community as well where we, we have systems where you can see people for a period of time or you can see a client but not necessarily the whole family when in fact you might think there's a benefit it to the family. Any thoughts about that in terms of how we can how we can kind of be thinking about working in a way that's that's meeting the needs, particularly when we're talking about Melissa needing support over a long period of time, but our practice might not enable that, or a rural community might not have access to referral sources. Any thoughts about that? Well, there's a couple of things I, I would say. Firstly, the general practice is the usual first call, port of call and often the only port of call. Um, you may be able to get access to a um, rural nurse or you might be able to get access, access to a rural counsellor, but often there's a waiting period associated with that and often these people need help straight away. So it's back to the GP again. Uh, it is possible where people are not doing so well to actually arrange a teleconference and teleconferences or Skype can be arranged with a, a number of um, psychologists in Adelaide or practitioners in Adelaide. Uh, my answer to the question was um, I wasn't going to get any government help and that's been pretty accurate over the last 30 years um, or any other help and so we uh, train people in our local town to go and do a counselling course and become counsellors. Um, my wife, for example, was a teacher. I said, we don't need teachers, we need counsellors. So she went off and did a course in mental health counselling. Um, we train the nurses to understand um, uh, mental health issues much better. And so when someone came in and said, I'm, I'm not coping or I'm feeling down or I don't know what I'm feeling, that we, we gave them a list of questions to ask the the, the patient, so the patient knew um, um, that the nurse was on board, could, was understood that the nurse was asking the right questions and they felt free to answer. That was a very, very successful program. So increasing com community capacity is probably one of the most useful things, apart from increasing uh, community um, education and we certainly work very hard at doing that in this in our town. And, we use any access group we could get into, whether it was uh, parents and friends associations or whatever else, so people understood mental illness uh, and mental health and where the uh, sources of help were and uh, we taught the people that the ultimate place was a local hospital where they would be redirected. I could just add as well. Yes. Uh, here. I've worked in um, the northwest of Australia for many years and now the northeast, far north Queensland. But we shouldn't underestimate as clinicians the importance of a supportive, empathic uh, connection with the person. So even it's easy to feel overwhelmed by another person's distress, and there's a lot happening for that for Melissa in a month. There's a kid who's also talked about. But uh, being available, being accommodating, and is in fact tremendously uh, helpful for Melissa and her family. So even if we are one, um, we don't need to be overly concerned that we don't have all the grief therapy under our belt. Being having a supportive approach, problem solving, and validating. And again, grief. I just want to reiterate that it is a journey. It takes time. There's different ways of grieving, and it's not something that gets um, fixed like a broken leg. Uh, increasingly grief stays with you for a long time and just gets incorporated into life experiences. You, grief is the price of love as some people say so even decades after a person dies the pangs of grief come up an anniversary and so on. So again rather than feeling terrorized or overwhelmed by the patient worried that the patient needs a, a dramatic intervention and even in remote areas um, there's, there's things that can be done by a, by a sensible uh, supportive good all-around skills and, and if need be, as Graham mentioned, there's um, other, other resources that can be mm, Fantastic, thank you. And I think people are really um, enjoying your non-medicalisation of grief. There's a few comments are coming through that, that people are really appreciating that, which is fabulous.
Um, it, it's worth remembering that suicide is a very rare event. So mm -hmm. the Australian suicide rates are at, say, 10 to 15 uh, in the population, in some of the high-risk groups, um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who can be uh, five to 10 times that in select population. But even putting it at the highest rate, it's about 150 or in, in 100,000 people. So it's tremendously rare. Um, and so giving good clinical care to the bereaved, to those who might be at risk of suicide, um, that's really the key, rather than trying to pick which person out of the 100,000 is going to be the person who's going to kill themselves. That's, that's really, um, I'll try to put it this way, a fool's errand. Rather, mm -hmm. um, it's the low-risk people, such as uh, um, Melissa's husband, who, yes, he was drinking, he was unhappy, but there are lots of people like that all over the, all over the country. Yeah. Most of them own suicide, so it's not about so we do have to bear that risk in mind and inquire about it in all yeah. clinical assessments. But rather than be dominated by that, it can provide good supportive clinical care and help yeah. them problem solve. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you. Jacinta, did you just want to comment on um, bringing families and support people around the person? Because I guess that's the other thing is, is that we can, as practitioners, be providing that level of support. But you, you were really clear around um, friends and families and the community um, helping people access that, but sometimes that can be really difficult if if people are finding it hard to um, do that. And we did have in the case study that Melissa was finding some conflict with with um, Daryl's family, and some of her um, friends were were kind of avoiding her, so perhaps mm. struggling to to know how to respond. So any sort of thoughts about how you might help Melissa to open that door as another opportunity of support for her? Mm. Yeah, like. Um Sure. I mean, one of the common experiences also displayed in that case study uh, is that, um, uh, you know, the blame from parents or parents-in-law um, and um, and or people who are in some, some part of the extended family. And I think it be, can be quite isolating for, for the intimate partner, at least in this sort of situation. Um, and, and a lot of um, psychoeducation can be really helpful in that respect if, if Melissa is is able to get counselling. I think we're not well um, educated in any of the professions because there is there is a limited, in fact there's zero curriculum um, in all undergraduate courses that dedicate a whole course, not just a guest speak lecture or something on this. So it, I would advise people to get a little bit um, of knowledge on this if, if they don't have a lot, but just about how um, you know, that this can be an expected outcome. So that feeling excluded, it may begin there and it can be very real or it can be a self-fulfilling prophecy, of course, as well for people where they, they experience the public stigma and internalise the per that and it becomes very personal stigma. Um, and this is something that we're also not very well um, versed in at the moment. But ha knowing that those sorts of experiences Melissa has, I would, I would very much encourage, as Steve said, I mean, I don't think I think all of this has to be understood that all these sorts of grief responses um, are clearly um, not pathological, clearly, and um, a very, very difficult um, and stigmatised still today event, although less so than historically, um, means that the person is going to have a whole heap of very different responses compared to even, to obviously natural death causes, but also um, similar death causes. And I would, what I would do with people that I've seen um, when they've come to that point, so as an interventionist, it's, you're reliant on getting a referral, um, et cetera. Um, but I, I would very much get Melissa in those early days. Some people just come from one or two sessions to get that educational kind of um, information, but others will come and they really don't know how to seek help because, of, as in Melissa's case, they feel people are going to not want to go near her. They turn their heads away. Some of that might be very real. Some might be imagined. Um, but in any case, that reaching out thing can be encouraged by saying, well, Melissa, your really good friend Karen here um, has obviously shown that she's very interested in wanting to support you and keen to do that, etc. One of the things that we find is really helpful, but clearly you can decide for yourself, but is um, asking your friend to perhaps ring you at this point in time each week, for example, over the next few weeks, um, if you don't feel comfortable and, and reaching out for that help. And so you set up a little kind of plan with the close connections that that person has. It could be a boss or a, someone at work. Um, and, and once, 
and it's quite surprising, I think, people's responses to that because they actually say, look, I wouldn't have rung, well, not only Lifeline or more formal things, but I wouldn't have rung those sources. I just wanted to speak to someone to listen to my story and where I'm at. Um, and But if they don't do that, at least the friend's there to do that. Yeah, great. Thank you. So seeing a community around around the person but recognising it can be, it can be really quite a hard time to do that, but it's a really important, important thing to know. Now our time is nearly up and I can see there's lots of questions that we're just never ever going to get to and I guess some of them are, are really around um, suicide risk assessment and a whole range of, of other topics as well that, that are obviously really important to people and are very mindful of, of leaving some of those unanswered. We have given you in the resources a whole lot of um, websites and links and um, some children's book suggestions, a whole lot of things that hopefully will, will give you a place to go away and, and have a look at, um, look at and get a bit of information um, to answer some of those, those questions. But it does highlight, I guess for me, the the, um, the great interest that people have and I guess the, the lack of resources that are there or easily accessible for people to be able to get these answers. So I'm very mindful of that and um, it's quite difficult to, to obviously answer all of those. I do want to finish off though with returning to the theme that we, we did begin with and people have identified as well in terms of self-care and looking after ourselves and particularly given that we are perhaps leaving people with some questions as much as answers. Hopefully we have given you some answers and some ideas but you may still have a lot of questions and thinking about that leaving you perhaps a little bit unsettled. I'm just going to ask each of the panellists to share um, an idea around self-care, people, what what do we want people to be doing to look after themselves in in this particular space? So, Jane, let's begin with you. What would you be suggesting that people people could do? I find briefly a really helpful um, way is looking at self-compassion. So, Kristin Neff yeah. talks about self-compassion, and there's a great, uh, very short self-compassion meditation that you can do where you um, just acknowledge the feelings that you're having and then recognise that those feelings are normal and that anybody in your situation who's helping people would have those feelings yeah. and then invite yourself to bring kindness to yourself in that moment. And yeah. if you look up www.selfcompassion.org and there's guided meditations and information, evidence-based information about self-compassion and mindfulness in, in this space. Fantastic, thank you. That's a great tip. I think we might all need to go home and, and, and do that tonight because it, it is um, lots that we've been talking about. So thank you. And, and I guess it's practicing what we preach sometimes, isn't it? We often talk Absolutely. to with clients about having self-compassion. So thinking about it's that. It's great to teach to clients as well. As well yeah. As yeah. Yeah, do it too. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you. Graeme, what about you? What are your, your sort of take-home messages around what, what we think people can do to look after themselves? And particularly to uh, I, I think uh, debrief is pretty good with colleagues um, and um, we live in a pressure pack uh, um, surgery and at the end of the day all the doctors sit together with the uh, senior staff and we talk about the events of the day and we all go home quite uh, taking nothing home hopefully that uh, needs to be discussed tomorrow. So we, we definitely, and we're doing this for 20 years now, just definitely try and debrief after every day, Monday to Friday. And if we're not debriefing there, we'll debrief at the hospital with a nursing staff if it's been a medical event. And I find that very, very effective. Yep, fantastic. So don't take it home, basically. Find someone to talk yep. to so you can go home and, and yep. have your own time. Yeah, great, thank you, really important. So, And that takes planning and time sometimes to think about that. It doesn't, you don't necessarily have colleagues just with you all the time, so planning that is great. Thank you. What about you, Siva? What would you be your self-care message for people listening? Well, I, I think the um, main point I'd say is that it is a journey. Um, what, what, we, what can't be cured must be endured. So we can learn to endure uh, the suffering in life and perhaps it is essential that these unexpected things we have to endure it with our patients uh, or clients. And uh, learning to endure it with uh, nobility, wisdom, and uh, a sense of humour that elevates us all. Fantastic, thank you. So a bit more of a philosophical approach, which is which is helpful as well in terms of meaning. I guess it comes back to that, doesn't it? Making making meaning of of things that happen. So thank you. And lastly, but not least, Jacinta, what would be your takeaway, take home, self care message for people? 
Uh, look, I, I agree with everyone else's. Um, um, I think we have to recognise as well embarking on such a very difficult and very complex um, field that we have to, I like the Zulu proverb that says, you can't really wipe away another person's tears without getting your own hands wet. Um, and it means that going into such a field, there is going to be a high likelihood that you're going to experience some quite negative experiences yourself. So always reach out, love those who are close to you, always put them at the forefront um, because yeah, it, it is a journey and, and the quality of life for you taking that journey can only be a good one if, if you look after yourself. Okay, so give yourself permission to yeah. do that. Yep, okay, thank you. And I can see people saying thank you, that there are still lots of questions, but the, but people are, um, are thanking us for a thought-provoking session, so that's, that's always, always, always good to hear, but we are very mindful that hopefully you'll go away and, and look at some of those links and, and really find some ways to, to get the information that you might need, talk to, talk to other people. Um, and really yeah, try and work out what, what works for you in your particular environment. Remember at the end we will have this exit survey that will pop up in a moment and certificates of attendance for the webinar will be issued within the next four weeks. You'll be sent a link to the online resources within the next two weeks. So look out, look out for these and um, share them with your colleagues. Perhaps you could use that as a chance to, to set up a bit of a network or um, some collegiate support that, that could be um, a useful way to begin. MHPN, of course, continue their series of webinars. And the next webinar titled Supporting the Mental Health of People Living with Obesity will be held on Wednesday the 6th of September. Same time, same place, 7.15 p.m. And you can sign up at that link, the upcoming webinars link, and another reminder there in terms of um, Lifeline and um, phone number and the website, as well as the, the other resources if you're just wanting to have a read of, read of something. But we do really want you to um, take good, good care of yourself. If you're interested in joining an MHPN network in your local area, there's um, a link there as well for um, some networks that, that are another way of, of you getting some extra support and, and to link in with other people who are, who are in your actual local geographical area. So that might be another, another avenue and other information as um, online activities and networks that's available at the MHPN website. So I'd, I'd like to thank very much our panellists for their, their work and their planning um, leading into this webinar. We, we did put a lot of effort into thinking about um, the topic and realising that we had a lot of interest and that it is, is a um, challenging topic. I'm hoping that, that the positive messages that have come through have, have given people um, some a sense of hope that can then be shared with, with clients and um, patients. And would like to thank our probably a thousand people or more that, that have joined this live event and of course people seeing it later on. So very, thank you very much for your contribution and your participation and good evening. We'll see you at the next webinar. Thanks everyone. Mm -hmm.